Hello everyone and good day. A very warm welcome to the India Conference at Harvard 2021. Our panel topic for today is COVID-19 in India, roles and responsibilities of the public versus private sectors in forming a health systems response. In light of the current circumstances given COVID, we decided to go virtual this year in engaging with our audience and leveraging our platform to provide us a fertile ground for deep discussions while celebrating the intellectual diversity that forms the very foundation of our identity. Before starting today's sessions, I would like to briefly go over some housekeeping items. We will kickstart the session with opening remarks from our respected panelists and moderator. This will be followed by a 25 minute intra panel discussion and 15 minutes of audience Q&A. We value our audience engagement more than anything else. Please use the Q&A function to post your questions. You will have the opportunity to upvote questions. We encourage you to utilize this function if you spot your question, as opposed to re-entering it separately. Upvoted questions will appear on top of the pile and will be presented to the panelists by my colleague Unnati Mehta. We respect and acknowledge the fact that there will be differences in perspectives but we humbly request our participants to kindly keep the comments and questions respectful and civil such that we can all learn and grow from each other's ideas. We also request you to please tag us and use the hashtag ICH2021 to tweet and share your favorite quotes, insights and moments from our panel. Now, without much further ado, I request my colleague Shraddha Chhabria to introduce our panelists for the day. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. Popularly known as Shailaja teacher, Minister KK Shailaja is the current Minister for Health, Social Justice, and Woman and Child Development of the State of Kerala, and current member of the Legislative Assembly representing Kutuparamba constituency. She has received international attention and praise for her leadership in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic in Kerala. She was honored at the United Nations Public Service Day and was named one of the world's most influential women in 2020. Hopefully she will be joining us shortly. Dr. Sangeeta Reddy is the Joint Managing Director of Apollo Hospitals Group, India's first and now Asia's largest and premier private healthcare group. She is also the immediate past president of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. She is strengthening the Indian health system through technology, education, and humanitarian initiatives with a focus on transforming rural and primary care. She was named best female healthcare leader in 2019 as the recipient of the IMA Medico Award. Dr. Gagandeep Gung is an acclaimed virologist at the Christian Medical College, Velour. She is known for her interdisciplinary research on enteric infections. She has built national rotavirus and typhoid surveillance networks, established laboratories, and driven India's advances in clinical vaccine trials. She has set many records as an Indian and in science, fellow of the Royal Society, recipient of the Infosys Prize in Life Sciences, and editor of the Manson's Textbook of Tropical Medicine, to name just a few accolades. Our moderator, Professor Srinath Reddy, is the current president of the Public Health Foundation of India and former head of the Department of Cardiology at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, AIMS. He was the inaugural Bernard Lown Visiting Professor of Cardiovascular Health at the Harvard School of Public Health. Widely regarded as a leader, researcher, teacher, and advocate of preventive cardiology at national and international levels, he has published more than 500 scientific articles in international and Indian peer-reviewed journals. We are so honored to be joined by this esteemed group of speakers. I will now turn it over for them for their I will now turn over to them for their introductory remarks on their work and perspectives during the COVID-19 pandemic. Professor Reddy. Well, thank you very much. Uh, COVID-19 has indeed challenged health systems all across the world. But as we learn from the COVID-19 pandemic and our experiences thereof, to try and build fairly resilient uh, health systems for the future, we do need to share global experiences. Indeed, COVID-19 is not going to be a permanent state. And we must learn from our experiences during the current pandemic as we move ahead to build much stronger, efficient and equitable health systems. And for that, we have an eminent panel which is going to be addressing some of the questions and identifying the learnings, particularly from India. 
I thank the Harvard community for convening this webinar in the best spirit of global health equity. Before I begin to engage with the stellar panel on India's health system, permit me to pay homage to the hallowed memory of a great Harvard physician who passed on his legacy of commitment to global health equity last week when Professor Bernard Lawn passed on that torch has been passed on, not only to the Harvard community, but to the entire world. Professor Lam, who departed from us last week, was a distinguished cardiologist who invented the cardiac defibrillator, graded ventricular arrhythmias, identified their neurogenic origin, and demonstrated the efficacy of lidocaine in treating them. Even more important, he founded the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War and received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985, only the second doctor to receive a Nobel Peace Prize. Throughout his life, he fought against racism and discrimination of any kind. He was a passionate advocate of health equity. May his resolute and rebellious spirit guide our discussions today. Let me begin by engaging Professor Gagandeep Kang. Dr. Kang, you're currently co-chairing a Lancet Commission on Reimagining India's Healthcare System. Given India's experience with COVID-19, in your view, what are the key reforms that must now be undertaken in order to build a much more capable health system which can address all of India's healthcare needs, not only in the follow through to the COVID-19 pandemic, but for the future health needs of the country. Thanks Dr. Reddy for that question. I think in India, we have a great ability to conceptualize very well what is required for health. So if we look at the national health policy, for example, the most recent version of it speaks to a world that for India and for health is perfection written down. The problem is that we have truly outstanding policies, but we don't do as well in implementing those policies. So if we look at what currently exists, it's a health system where uh, the bulk of provision of health care comes from the private sector and if anybody who can afford to prefers not to access the public system. Yet in terms of policy matters, everything that is the governance that is provided seems to be aimed entirely at the public system. So in the Lancet Commission, what we plan to do is to develop a roadmap for the next 10 years, looking at how do we bridge this gap between what is the ideal and what exists? What will set us on the road to the sustainable development goals? It seems likely that many of the parameters that we hope to achieve for the SDGs will not be achieved, but is there a transitional state that we can get to that will get us further along the way there. And the COVID-19 pandemic is a way to learn what would be the components of such a roadmap. If we look at what has worked and what has not worked, I think there is a lot of learning there. If we look at infectious diseases in particular, we have very siloed structures where every disease has its own control program and the ability to integrate different sources of information is very, very limited. If we look at clinical protocols, um, they are decided but not implemented. There's great variation in the quality of care that is provided across public and private sectors. And if we look at how COVID has been managed, 
we managed to take what was a public health problem and turn it into a law and order problem to the extent that a lot of people now are not willing to come forward and admit that they have either a fever or respiratory systems symptoms. So what will it take for us to build trust in a system? What will it take for us to build resilience in the system? I think the one lesson that is clear is that while top-down regulation is required, the local knowledge and systems at state levels in a federal structure are as important and partnerships across all stakeholders are going to be critical to deliver what we need to deliver. Thank you. Uh, there is always that debate about efficiency and equity, that the private sector is more efficient, but the public sector is more equitable. You think these two can be balanced together? I think when we think about equity, the biggest thing that we need to worry about is really about catastrophic health expenditures. And what we have seen, particularly over the last year, has been that in the populations that I work with, certainly this has only increased. The government has provided a lot of health care, has set a lot of price caps on the provision of care, has rolled out a vaccination program that we hope will lead to greater equity where this disease and other diseases are concerned. But so far, that has been challenging to achieve. I think if we think about efficiency in the healthcare system, I don't think all parts of the private healthcare system are equal either. So there is a lot that we need to be doing in both public and private healthcare systems. Well, you're setting forth a fairly ambitious agenda of health sector reform in India in your own Lancet Commission endeavors. Uh, how do you think you're going to be getting this financed? Uh, you think the poor level of uh, public financing and the high level of out-of-pocket expenditure can be addressed in the reform process? I think we are going to have to do that. We have had national health policy after national health policy. We have had statement after statement from the government that the proportion of government spending on healthcare will increase. And we wait every year for a budget that tells us that it's going to do better. And we don't see that change. So I think it's time for us to think about not necessarily relying wholly on the government, but thinking about how we can better leverage mechanisms that are available in the private sector. And while trying to persuade the government that it does need to increase its share of spending. Uh, Sangeeta, Dr. Gagandeep Kang has passed on the torch to you not only speaking of how private sector has been a very major force in providing health care to India in the past few decades, but how it has to be an important contributor in the future health system design as well. How do you see the private sector making a balanced contribution across all levels of care, primary, secondary, and tertiary? And in that context, how do you envision the role of public-private partnerships? So uh, first, let me say that I'm very happy to be on this panel. And while no one has commented yet, uh, Dr. Srinath Reddy, you are providing this important balance uh, in gender. Uh, and I'm happy to see you know, the panelists uh, all being female. I, but really moving into the question, the, the tremendous aspect about COVID has really been that it's forced us to rethink everything that we have been doing, every methodology, every capability, uh, even the way you know this conference is being held virtual. However, there are some universal truths in the overall. Number one being that 
uh, universal coverage is most critical and people cannot afford to pay for care out of pocket. So finding a way to cover the whole country is critical. Number two, I think that we must continue to work not just towards public-private participation, but removing the artificial divide between public and private. Whether it's in the way they're provisioned for, they're governed, they're uh, partnered, all this, uh, because ultimately, I actually believe that the customer doesn't really care whether it's public or private, they just want good care. And then acknowledging the different sectors or the segments of what we need to get done. is policy and governance, there is the, the whole provisioning of care, and then there is enabling people to understand and access care. And then you look at you know, just um, coverage or insurance or the geographic and financial access, uh, the quality of care. And I, and I must say that many, many health systems across public and private in India have been able to deliver some very high standards of care. And we must celebrate and figure out methodology to replicate. And finally, there's the cost. So if you look at universal access, high quality and costs, and then you look at policymakers, providers, and societies, and build on these metrics, which, uh, you know, and then you move into this aspect of beyond universal coverage, this very critical aspect of focus on prevention. Because if people, and I think they have, if the society understood the importance of social distancing, masks, and sanitization, and followed these protocols, we reduced the number of people who got COVID. When we reduced the number of people who got COVID, we reduced the, the strain on the hospitals, whether they were public or private. So this whole aspect of re-energizing primary and preventive care and acknowledging the fact that um, we, healthcare, I think, again, in this COVID period, it came out so clearly that healthcare is not just the government's responsibility, not just the private hospital, not just your family doctor, but society as a whole. It's individuals, it's government, it's private. And interestingly, and you know, very significantly, it brought out the importance of science. Can you test more? Can you put up labs? Can you find a vaccine? Can you innovate on care protocols and pathways? Uh, so, you know, I think that it's critical for private healthcare to step up, private healthcare to be funded differently so that they can enable more affordable cost. Uh, it's very important for us to understand the dynamic between uh, the cost, which are the input, and then the output. Uh, but before that, I think uh, we were, you know, kind of quickly asked to talk about uh, COVID and COVID response. So I'm going to very quickly do that from the perspective of, uh, you know, what we did at Apollo. And uh, the reason I want to uh, kind of share this is because I believe that the approach is something that can be replicated. So we, we created what we called coverage, which is this protective, uh, it means protection or shield. And the first layer of coverage was really information and awareness information internally, so awareness, guide compliance with government guidelines, and then multi-stakeholder awareness. So society, we educated as much as we could, corporate or the organized sector. Uh, we went ahead to talk to other nursing homes and hospitals and create protocols. Our pharmacies, so we made sure that all 3,700 pharmacies found a way to stay open and deliver. We created an app where we had over 1,200,000 uh, downloads and then went on to create a helpline because people still prefer the phone or calling. And then created a COVID risk scan because we wanted to involve public in the care. So what's your risk? How do you minimize risk? The second tier of, of uh, approach was fever clinics, testing, ramping up testing, hotel, uh, which we converted using telehealth into isolation rooms and home care. And the third and the final was really the hospitals. So we provided over uh, 2,900 beds, about 800 of them were ICU. 
Uh, we created the core protocol using the great point that Dr. Kang made of multidisciplinary from infectious disease, because we really don't have enough infectious disease people to be at every bedside. But the protocol and the care, immunology, cardiology, internal medicine, put them together, created the red book, and then shared that. I'm going to stop at this point, but I just want to say that this aspect of every element of care. So private sector is here not just to do amazing heart surgery or to bring the latest in cancer. Private sector can partner in primary health. Private sector can work to keep segments of the population that they take care of healthy. Uh, private sector can work together with government on policy, on public outreach. And also we can partner extensively with the scientific community for new and novel solutions. So I'm looking for holistic, for universal coverage, and for extensive partnerships uh, across the ecosystem. Yesterday, the Niti Aayog member for health, Dr. V.K. Paul, said that soon the private sector will be allowed to vaccinate people, perhaps at a cost. Uh, do you think it's time now? Or uh, do you think that uh, the public sector must attend to the people who they have already prioritized before the public sector has access to administration of vaccines in a market model? So, uh, Dr. Srinath, that is a great question, and I think this is the question in everyone's mind. Uh, when the policy was first announced, I was very appreciative uh, of the overall fact because it was such a well-crafted public health-based policy healthcare workers, then frontline workers, then you go to, and irrespective, and I must acknowledge the government on two things, they broke the artificial divide between public and private. They added private healthcare workers in their insurance coverage, and they added them in their vaccine coverage. So I think private is, is really very appreciative and indebted to the governments looking at all of us together. But coming directly to the question, I, I appreciated the plan I thought it was the best thing to do in an environment of vaccine shortage. Then you prioritize. Now that we've seen, number one, that we do have enough vaccines. Number two, the vaccine hesitancy of some of the sectors. And the fact that we have heard and seen on some of the vials that some of these vaccines are going to expire in April or May. So it's important for us to utilize and cover as much as possible. The second thing is that if we abet the budget by making people who can afford uh, come parallelly and pay for it, you will enable a wider reach. And once you have a wider reach, you all know better than I do about the aspect of herd immunity and cover society. So if we look at it as parallel methodologies without in any way affecting the most vulnerable or denying those who cannot afford it themselves. So parallel strategies to reach our goal fast, then I do commend it and I do look forward to an early opening. And Dr. Kang, uh, we were on a self-congratulatory note in this country, thinking that uh, COVID has actually receded and perhaps ended and uh, saying that uh, we have succeeded in all our efforts uh, to quell the epidemic. But now we are seeing for the past few days a rise in number of cases in many states and the national numbers to have gone up. Do you think there has been a failure in our health system response that we must learn from and how can we correct it in order to quickly put down this flare up? And secondly, how do we actually take lessons from that for future responses? Well, in order to control this pandemic, there really are only two ways. One is to uh, prevent infections and the other is to induce immunity. And if we want to prevent infections and the transmission of infections, we go back to what we have been doing as mitigation strategies, which is the test, trace, isolate that was required of us, the non-pharmaceutical interventions with which we are all familiar. And we are aware that this is something that has been declining in the past few months as people have become perhaps um, tired of the pandemic or confident that they are not going to get infected. 
The second is to protect people. And we have zero surveys that tell us that significant proportions of the population have already been infected. This is much more in urban areas than in rural areas where data tend to be much more limited. As yet, we don't have enough immunization for immunization to be a source of significant protection to slow the spread of disease. So obviously we need to be ramping up vaccination as we continue with the mitigation strategies. And yes, I think the emphasis really needs to be on amplifying efforts for both of these. Thank you. Sangeeta, one of the questions that always comes up when we talk about the private sector is about the question of regulation, even in a mixed health system. Uh, indeed, the 15th Finance Commission has said that the regulation of the private sector is weak and has called for stronger regulation. How do you respond to that? So clearly anything that involves you know, public in this large manner requires regulation. I uh, look forward to the regulation being simple to comply from a documentation and paperwork perspective. Last year, at, as president of FIKI, uh, we you know, worked on what businesses across India are calling one of their biggest pain, and that is ease of doing business. A medium-sized business has over 6,450 documentary or inspection-related compliances. I don't think private healthcare has the capacity to absorb anything of that nature. So I look forward to it being simple. I look forward to a quality awareness uh, more than regulation and a kind of unified approach in terms of outcomes-based uh, communication. One of, one of the weakest areas I think are actually communication to public and private. So if we can have a strategic plan around those, and bring them in, in terms of regulation. Uh, so, you know, some level of working together and a better framework and a regulator, uh, I think the word is actually a positive enabler, which I would like to look at and hope for. Okay. Uh, Dr. Khan, India's vaccine production has been seen as a global success story with a huge capacity for production of vaccines as well as development of vaccines, not just manufacturing. Uh, do you think our health system uh, presents the picture of private sector success or a good public-private partnership in this endeavor? If we look at the history of our vaccine industry, the vaccines that we have made have been largely directed at routine immunization programs for children. They have been high volume productions, but usually low value vaccines. And that was we relied rather like the generics manufacturing for drugs, we relied on technologies that already existed, which we refined and innovated on to be able to do uh, quality products at a low price. But the fact remained that we did not use the new technologies for vaccines that were in the making. There were very few companies in India that were investing in making vaccines that relied on new technologies. In the pandemic, what we have seen is that our vaccine industry linked very quickly to companies and organizations outside India in order to acquire those technologies. So much so that every platform that is being used for vaccine development anywhere in the world is also being developed. Such a vaccine is also being developed in India. And that is remarkable, but that does not speak to vaccine research in India. That is something that I hope the government will address for the next pandemic. So we've done well. We've done well as the private sector making the links early to get the technologies. 
where public private partnership has come in has come in for certain products and for certain aspects of the development particularly with regard to clinical testing of some candidates which the icmr has been leading on and the investment in new technologies which are further behind which the department of biotechnology has been leading on so i'm hoping that that will pay dividends both for this pandemic where we will have hopefully clinical efficacy data for the products that are being developed entirely in india and for new products that will be developed through the partnership that the department of biotechnology is supporting sangeeta you have been working with both the central and the state governments india is a federal entity with health as a state subject though some powers have been acquired by the central government during this pandemic under the epidemic diseases act and the disaster management act uh, do you see the center state collaboration proceeding smoothly and do you think this is likely to be a harbinger of better national coordinated efforts so dr sinathri to be really honest i believe that we need a lot more clarity in terms of the methodology of um, of passing on policy we were in literally in the trenches and you know you have hospitals across for us 17 states and every state government had a different interpretation of the central policy so at a practical on the ground level the interpretation of policy should not be um, you know as complex and as variable as it was during the pandemic so i'm i'm being really honest here because you asked me a direct question and i believe that um you know we we need to learn things and put them forward in the interest of a better future so so clearly if there can be a methodology to say this is kind of a non varying policy let's implement it across the country in a similar manner i think we will create a, a better degree of standardization and the speed and effective implementation which is clearly what we need i think dr kang said it very appropriately earlier in this conversation that we are fantastic at conceptualizing we have some beautiful models how do we take them to scale and ensure execution to the point that we've really touched the last mile or the last village you know or the last household and i think in the interest of that it's important to have a deeper early on dialogue and quicker more effective um, standardized implementation strategy so so that's where i'm coming from on that uh, deep question and if i thank may, you very much for your candor if i may dr sina i do call out one thing which i yeah, believe uh, did very well and you know besides the private hospitals were of course uh, expected to serve and after initial hesitancy on some part everybody did step up step up but the one sector which really swung into action was the manufacturing whether it was the production of ppes when india started when the pandemic started we we barely made 10000 ppes a day today it's 450000 ppes and india is exporting uh, the other one is medical equipment the fact that you know um, we were able to to manufacture or produce uh, the the ventilators the respirators the new level of masks all these are really testimony to the fact that indian industry and indian manufacturing can do if the focus is there so channelizing this capability into focus enhancing the indian manufacturing sector and thereby uh, tackling one of the important input costs in the entire healthcare chain therefore enabling a lower cost of care i think is another very important lesson that we must take away from the pandemic or an opportunity as well as a lesson thank you very much uh, minister shailaja has not been able to join us i believe uh, so perforce i'll try and insert myself into the panel for a few remarks uh, I, you no no you you had pointed out that this is a all women panel and i applaud that too so i apologize for and on behalf of my gender for intruding into this panel 
So, uh, but uh, basically I believe that the pandemic has shown that in a mixed health system, uh, we can actually draw out the best from the public sector, the private sector and the voluntary sector. And indeed, as we develop our health system forward, we ought to utilize all of these societal resources in the most optimized manner with an appropriate framework of universal health coverage with adequate regulation as needed, but also enough ability to innovate within each systems. Uh, now, of course, we do recognize that we do need universal health coverage, which has a very strong emphasis on primary health care. And that primary health care has to be comprehensive, continuous, providing chronic care as well, particularly with the burden of non-communicable diseases. And it has to be connected seamlessly to other levels of care with portability of data, both across levels of care as well as across institutions and across geographic uh, boundaries within the country. Uh, all of this has to have a fair amount of public financing to accompany it because we cannot afford to have the 60% level of out-of-pocket expenditure that we have now. And we also need, as Professor Ramalingaswamy used to say, not only more money for health, but also more health for the money. So we need more allocative efficiencies and more utilization efficiencies. And that is where we ought to look at how best we can get appropriate um, diagnostic and management algorithms, appropriate use of technologies. And COVID has actually shown why that is very important. Even urban primary healthcare, which has been long neglected, needs to be strengthened much further as the Finance Commission has pointed out, because we know whether it is case detection through syndromic surveillance of symptoms, a referral for early testing, contact tracing, care of long COVID during recovery. For all of these, primary care is going to be absolutely critical. We need to strengthen our district hospitals because we recognize that more than ventilators, oxygen equipped uh, hospitals, and uh, simple methods like proning are quite effective in treating very sick COVID patients. So we need to strengthen even those levels of care and our emergency transport systems also need to be strengthened further on. Uh, it's very clear that we do require public-private partnerships at various levels, that in a mixed health system, we cannot afford to completely ignore any single contributor, and we must mobilize all societal resources. Uh, I see PPP as a partnership for a public purpose rather than for profit, or uh, essentially, we have to define that public purpose and configure our health system uh, to high levels of efficiency and equity so that we can best collectively serve that public purpose. And COVID has shown us that it's possible to do so despite some hitches and we ought to learn the lessons from that. And if we can actually learn how center state coordination can be better um, um, modeled and implemented and how the various contributors to our healthcare can be brought in whether it is a manufacturer of vaccines or a manufacturer of medical equipment. And uh, we also recognize that immunization itself now requires a collective effort uh, to scale up. Uh, I believe that we would go forth from this COVID-19 pandemic with many, many valuable lessons learned and uh, possibly build a much more resilient and resolute health system that will deliver appropriate and affordable health care for all of India to come. Now, I thank my co-panelists, but pass on uh, to the Harvard group uh, to let the questions flow in from the, uh, from the participants, where I believe impatiently waiting uh, to throw quite a lot of questions at our uh, uh, eminent panel. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Reddy. Um, before we begin the Q&A, we would just like to reiterate, as Professor Reddy had mentioned, that Minister Shailaja was unable to join us today because of connectivity issues, as she's on the election trail. Um, but without further delay, uh, we'll get right into the Q&A. Um, so our first question is for Dr. Reddy. Do you think that India can grow into a hub for global medical tourism? And what are the opportunities and challenges to that end? So well, 
Uh, well, uh, Sangeeta is probably better equipped to answer that question because she is a great proponent, but I will nevertheless attempt it. I do. Well, um, sorry, just to clarify, it was, it was, uh, the question is for uh, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, but I think both of you can definitely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Then you better call me Srinath <laughs> and then it becomes easier. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Dr. Srinath Reddy, you say something. No, 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 no. You, you, you go ahead. You're, you're, you're the right ready to answer this. Yeah, the question is ready made for you. <laughs> and I am ready because I think the country is. Uh, there is no doubt that India is capable of delivering world class healthcare at a fraction of global prices. And with the, uh, the growing awareness of the fact that healthcare is increasingly becoming unaffordable, I think there is a tremendous opportunity uh, and not just, uh, you know, it's, it's a need to serve. It's a responsibility. So uh, we, when India first started, I think uh, I remember almost 20 years ago that I traveled to Tanzania and met the, the lady president who was running the Rotary program to send heart, uh, children, babies for heart surgery to Europe. And when I told her, Madam, uh, for every baby that you send to Europe, for that same money, we, India can treat and cure 10 babies. She switched the program the next month. And I applaud the great work that's being done all over the world, but India has some inherent opportunities that, uh, and some inherent uh, factors, whether it's the pharmaceutical cost or the cost of uh, manpower, or even the fact that our designs are quite simple. These enable us to create health systems which are very cost effective. And therefore I think this is uh, a huge, potential for us to serve the world. And now that you're seeing, you know, telehealth during the COVID pandemic, I think we did almost uh, 200,000 teleconsults. So the fact that we can serve with patients traveling into India, but using methodologies like EICU, telepathology, uh, teleconsults, uh, I truly visualize that a young India will take care of an aging world in many, many different formats. There will be our skilled people going all over the world. There will be patients from all over the world coming to India and there will be uh, electronic methodologies of, of treating and curing. And things like tele-mentored surgery are just around the corner. If you take you know, 4G, 5G, you take the skill gap, you take robotic surgery and in instrumentation, and the weights changed. Uh, all these are really auguring for a completely new vision of a connected world, and um, you know, kind of a determination to say that nobody should be denied access to care. Professor Shainath, if you would like to say a few words to this question, please go ahead. No, basically, I was going to say that it's absolutely important that we cater to the needs of our people as a high priority and not let medical tourism become a distraction from the point of view of our commitment to providing accessible and equitable care in the country. Uh, medical tourism is certainly possible and can be practiced. And certainly in the spirit of global solidarity, we ought to be able to provide good quality care at affordable prices even to other people across the world. However, that should not become the driving force for the transformation of our health system. Thank you. So if I can add just one quick point, and I think this ability to balance is something, uh, I don't know if any of us got an opportunity to really congratulate our government for the great work that they did uh, in you know, coordinating the pandemic, the early lockdown, the public messaging, bringing everyone together. It has been a tremendous, a stellar role. And, and like our prime minister very uh, you know, effectively said, that the world is really shrinking in terms of its borders and its differences. Uh, and while at some stage people are, are putting down barriers, it's for us to break these barriers. And I think medicine is a beautiful way to do so. So the concept of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, that the world is one family, and the fact that India said that we will you know, share our vaccines and share it at the same time, so which was government and a prime minister's uh, policy, I think the similar thing can definitely be achieved. 
And the fact is that I don't think there's any hospital in the country that does more than 10% of uh, its beds to two global uh, patients. So this balance can very easily be achieved. Uh, this was uh, just one additional point. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll now move on to our next question, which is for Dr. Gong. Um, given your recent critiques of the COVID, COVID vaccine regulatory process in India, do you think political considerations undermine science? And how will that, uh, that kind of influence affect the course of health sector reforms? So if we look at what the government proposed to do in September through its regulatory authority, which is the Central Drug Standards Control Organization, they had issued a document that very closely resembled the FDA and WHO documents about what would be required of a vaccine before they were willing to consider any form of approval. And that I thought was really a commendable effort to have guidance available for companies telling them exactly what was going to be required when uh, they wanted to get a vaccine approved. Now that was September. In December, we had Pfizer, um, Bharat Biotech and Serum Institute all applying for accelerated approval. Within our regulatory system, we don't have actually emergency use authorization but we do have permission to skip clinical trials in times of emergency when there is great national need. All three companies applied. Pfizer did not submit documentation. Uh, Serum gave um, the data from the AstraZeneca trials. Bharat gave data from its phase one, phase two trials and animal studies. And essentially, you had a package which fulfilled the requirements for serum and did not fulfill the requirements for Bharat Biotech based on what the CDSCO had issued as guidance. Nonetheless, the subject expert committee determined that both vaccines were required and gave that approval. Um, my only question and I continue to have that question, is given that there was guidance that was done in September at a time when our cases were peaking, really high rates of infection, um, why did we decide not to follow that guidance in January when our cases were at an all-time low? It is a determination made by the subject expert committee. I do not understand the basis of that determination and I really would like to have clarity on it. Nonetheless, we are in a situation where we have two vaccines being rolled out in the country. And I hope that the government will now, maybe I'm still dreaming a bit, but I hope that the government will issue guidance for vaccine manufacturers for what the future holds. Now that you have two vaccines that are in use, what is the standard of care? And what does this mean for vaccine manufacturers who must now do either bridging studies or phase three trials? Because once you have vaccines that become standard of care, then the requirements for every other vaccine that is in development has to change. And it would be really wonderful if that guidance could be provided. Thank you so much, Dr. Kang. Um, our next question is for uh, Professor Srinath Reddy. Uh, what investments by government agencies have been made to advance public-private partnerships? How can startups find financial, academic research, and infrastructure support for commercial-focused product development? I believe the Department of Biotechnology has a number of initiatives uh, which are actually supporting public-private partnership and particularly providing a great deal of incentives, not only to startups, but also to 
the larger manufacturers to get into a production mode uh, for a number of needed uh, biomedical technologies. Uh, and indeed, under many programs of the Department of uh, the Biotechnology and some under the Department of Science and Technology, you're finding a great deal of incentives being provided right from small startups uh, to very large manufacturing uh, enterprises. And uh, even during the COVID-19 period, special funds and programs have been designed uh, for uh, providing this kind of uh, impetus uh, not only for new vaccines, but new diagnostic equipment and also new therapeutic uh, products. Thank you, Professor Reddy. Um, so now we have, there, there seems to be a theme in, in several of the questions that we've received about um, how people in India may have become complacent about um, whether it's COVID uh, guidelines or public health guidelines um, to combat COVID. So uh, this is something for, uh, this is a question for all of the panelists. Um, what are your uh, thoughts and comments about people uh, not fully following guidelines and what do you think that the government can do? Um, and what is the contrast between urban and rural areas um, in that vein? Uh, so uh, maybe Professor Reddy, I, uh, Professor Shinath Reddy, I see you're unmuted. So if you'd like to start. <laughs> well, I think we do need to observe uh, our precautions with a great deal of uh, continuity and commitment because the danger has not passed. Uh, there's been much speculation about herd immunity having descended upon India and magically provided protection to everybody across this vast population. I don't think that's true. Uh, apart from the relative question about what is herd protection and herd immunity, whether somebody even in a 60 to 70 percent uh, immunized population can step out of that population to another part of the country or another part of the world where the transmission is still very active and find protection because there is no cloak of uh, protective people around uh, him or her. Apart from that, we do not even know what the threshold uh, for herd immunity for this particular virus is. However, there has been a certain degree of laxity, partly because also of uh, large crowds gathering because of political, religious, or social reasons, and wearing of masks has not been always universal and not in the right manner either. And certainly urban areas are doing it more partly because enforcement is also much better, not only the publicity. Rural areas, the, the lack of interest in wearing masks is quite apparent in a number of areas and the enforcement is also relatively weak. Having said that, there is no anti-masking movement. It requires much better communication, not only through national broadcast channels, but also through local community networks because whether it is uh, acceptance of a vaccine or whether it is compliance or adherence to masking or whether it is avoiding uh, fear and stigma, it is the local community networks which are going to be most effective. And I think that is where we ought to spend a little more time in people partnered public health and not leave it just to a top down approach. But having said that, uh, there is really no organized resistance against masks like in the United States. Uh, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, maybe if you'd like to provide your comments. So I, I think the fact that, you know, the, the entire environment has become a little bit more casual is, is true. Uh, whether it's because the fear of, of COVID has gone, the theories that India has already tackled it, many of these are floating around. And also maybe people are just tired and it's also a result of the economy kind of pushing back to, to get into motion or normalization. However, I completely agree with the comments that Dr. Srinath Reddy made. And I think uh, he's given us a gem of a term, which is people partnered health, uh, people partnered public health. And we'll just, you know, go back and start pushing on that. But uh, ultimately, I, I think that, uh, you know, we have, done as a country, we've done a really good job of the overall, and uh, we shouldn't mess up uh, the good work that's happened over the last 10, 12 months. So, so that I think is the underlying message that we, we get back into safety mode, 
enhance and accelerate the vaccine drive and use the lessons of uh, innovation, collaborative work and universal coverage uh, as the takeaway as we move forward into you know, this new year. Thank you so much, Dr. Reddy. And uh, finally, Dr. Kang, I invite you and I invite you to close out with your comments. I think what Dr. Reddy said is very important, but I will extend that further to say that, you know, if you look at the countries that have truly succeeded in controlling the pandemic and handling outbreaks, really what we've seen is trust in government. And if we are to build that trust in government, we do have to be thinking about a different way of working and to bring in what both he and Sangeeta said, this really requires partnerships and partnerships at a local level rather than the top-down approaches that we've seen. So how do we change the paradigm so that we view health as something that is a partnership between people, between the private sector and the public sector? We this is important, not just for COVID. It's important for every aspect of health. And this is something that we really do need to focus on. As Sangeeta pointed out, there are some enormous successes. The fact that we are in a state of absolute luxury, I think, in terms of the vaccines we have and are going to have. India is practically the only country where we don't have a vaccine shortage and we are thinking about distributing vaccines to the world. We've really invested in technology now. We've recognized its importance. We've really built out the manufacturing. These are all the good things. The not so good things, Back to what Dr. Reddy said, equity. How do you ensure equity? That it isn't money that determines the care you get. That's important for COVID and everything else. That's an important note to, to leave this off on. Um, Thank you all three of you so much for your comments and for engaging the Q&A. We got many incredible questions and, and our apologies that we couldn't get to all of them. But um, in the interest of time, um, I'd like to pass it on to, uh, yes, Dr. Nadi. I, I just wanted to say one line in congratulating Harvard, all of your students for continuing this program. I've, I've spoken there physically, uh, you know, a few times and I'm very happy that you found a way to continue and wish all of you the very best. And, uh, you know, look forward to all of you joining forces in, in the working team <laughs> of bringing better health for the world. Thank you so much. And credit to our uh, incredible planning team that is much more than the people that you've seen on the screen today. So uh, thank you so much for your comment. Um, and I'll pass it on now to Sana Faruqi who will give us our closing remarks. Thank you, Anati, and thank you, Dr. Reddy, for your remarks. Thank you all for, to all of our panelists for your time and for sharing your thoughts on this very important and relevant subject of India's COVID-19 response. A big thank you to our moderator, Professor Srinath Reddy, for putting so much thought and preparation into helping us uncover all sides of this topic. We'd also like to thank here Joysher, Gopal Kocheja, and Aditya Dahia for their assistance in putting this panel together. And finally, thank you to our audiences from India, the US, and elsewhere who tuned into our event and asked probing questions. Please join us now on our next panels on the future of cannabis in India and tackling unequal access in education, followed by the keynote remarks on vaccinations. Please also follow us online via the India Conference website and the ICH 2021 tag. Thank you so much, everyone.